thank you again for joining us today for the International Food Information Council Foundation webcast highlighting our 2012 Food and Health Survey findings. I'd first like to introduce today's speakers. We have Marianne Smith-Edge, the Senior Vice President of Food Safety and Nutrition here at the International Food Information Council and Foundation, and she's also a past president of the American Dietetic Association, now the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Also presenting today is Katie Burns, our Manager of Food Safety and Defense. We also have Elizabeth Rahavi, the Director of Health and Wellness. Anne Bouchou, the Senior Director of Nutrients and the Editor of our Food Insight Newsletter. And finally, Lindsay Loving, the Senior Director of Food Ingredients and Technology. Just a few um, points for housekeeping before we get started with today's webcast. As you may know, all of, all of our participants are on a forced mute, so please send all questions to foodandhealth at ific, I, F as in food, IC, dot org. We will answer the questions at the end of this webcast, but please feel free to send your questions throughout the webcast. We will be live tweeting this event through our at Food Insight Twitter handle, and we encourage you to join us using the hashtag foodandhealth. A PDF copy of today's slides will be available after the webcast at IFIC's Food and Health Survey resource page, which is www.foodinsight.org backslash foodandhealth2012.aspx. For those of you who are participating in today's webcast to get um, continuing professional education credits through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, we'd like to review our learning objectives for today. After today's webcast, you should understand consumer attitudes about and behaviors towards today's major food and health topics. You will be able to recognize consumers' interest in food and health issues and opportunities for improvement. And finally, you will be able to identify areas of misinformation, confusion, and lack of understanding that exist for consumers about food and health. As I mentioned, this webcast will be good for 1.5 um, CDR credits. At the conclusion of the webcast, you can download your certificate of completion at our Food and Health resource page, which again is www.foodinsight.org backslash foodandhealth2012.aspx. An email will be sent to all participants one hour after the webcast that will provide a link to that resource page. And again, as a reminder, please send all questions to Food and Health at ific.org. During today's discussion, we'll provide a brief background and, um, of our Food and Health Survey, the current environment, and highlight some trends. We will present the key findings of the webcast, and we'll conclude with a summary and takeaways, as well as a call to action for all of the nutrition communicators up, um, participating in today's webcast. And again, we will conclude with questions and answers. Please send all of your questions via email to foodandhealth at ific.org. And with that, I'll pass it over to our first presenter, Marianne Smith-Edge. Thank you, Katie, and good afternoon. Before we get started, just wanted to give you a little background on the International Food Information Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., and our mission is to effectively communicate science-based information on health, nutrition, and food safety in a way that educates the public. Our funding does come from primarily from the broad-based food, beverage, and agriculture industry, and our foundation is governed by an independence board of trustees, with a majority of our trustees coming from ac academic institutions. This is the seventh annual Food and Health Survey conducted by the IFIC Foundation. The goal of these surveys is to gain a deeper understanding of consumers' perspectives and behaviors and how Americans actually connect with food with their overall health. With seven years of information and using some of the same core questions, we are able to comment on changes from year to year and trends over the long term. But we've added some new questions this year to really gain more insight on consumers' behaviors. And today we will be sharing highlights from the 2012 survey. Following our presentation, you will be able to obtain ex the executive summary and, a, and report, as well as a copy of the slides, on our website, www.foodinsight.org. 
before we dive into the 2012 results, I want to just take a moment to reflect on, on today's environment, of which you're all familiar. We see through television programming, various forms of technology, government initiatives, that food, health, and nutrition has a highlighted focus and is often viewed through a microscopic lens. Food is discussed each and every day in multiple platforms through multiple perspectives. But what does it all mean? Are consumers doing better regarding their overall health? Are the messages seen through multiple platforms resonating with consumers, or is it just too much? And as we, as health professionals and educators, are we really connecting with the public? The 2012 Food and Health Survey provides insights to these questions and more. So let's get started. Our key takeaways that you will hear more insight on are consumers are taking an active role in improving their health. They are looking for specific items on the labels to improve health, such as whole grains. Consumers are often look to additional resources to verify food and health information, and they're seeking out information from a variety of sources. And we know that changing information on nutritional guidance is confusing. But despite all, we still know that taste and price is still the most important factors in purchasing decisions. As with previous years, this is, a, is an online web-based survey that was conducted with over a thousand Americans really looking at the health diet and influences on food selection. This year's survey was conducted by Matthew Greenwald and Associates of Washington, D.C. using Research Now Consumer Panel. And as you can see, the results were weighed to ensure that they're reflective of the uh, po as possible of the American population ages 18 to 80 as seen in the uh, 2011 current population survey and specifically they're weighed by age, education, gender, uh, race, ethnic, and region and the survey was conducted during the first part of April. Albert Einstein said the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax and consumers say that's simple compared to eating well. This year, slightly more than half of consumers agree that it's easier to do their own taxes than figure out how to eat well. And those most in need of learning the how-tos, those with elevated weight and chronic disease, are more at likely to find it even more difficult. And we see that one of the barriers uh, to improving the consumer's diet may actually be related to their own understanding of all the available nutrition information. When asked about the ever-changing nutrition information, three out of four agree that it's hard to know what's to believe. And we find those <coughs> consumers that are older and those with elevated weight status, as well as women, find it the most difficult. So to probe a little farther, uh, further about this statement, we ask, how would you decide what to believe? And in the open-ended question, as you will see, we find that more than 60% believe information that either they've, that they have researched personally, trust the information source, or just rely on their own judgment. In other words, acceptance of food and health information is through their own individual trust filters. So where is the disconnect between education and consumer understanding? And to find a little more detail on health and diet, I'm now turning it over to Elizabeth Rahabi to provide those insights. Thanks, Marianne. Since the survey's inception, we've been asking a baseline question to understand how Americans view their health. And overall, people feel pretty positive about their health. In fact, over 90% categorize their health from either good to excellent. And this year, six in 10 Americans put themselves in the top category, describing, them, describing their health as very good or excellent, while a little less than a third say that their health is good, and only 9% say that their health is fair or poor. We did see some statistical changes from 2011 to 2012, and this may be the result of a slight change in how we ask this question. Previously, we asked respondents what word best describes their health, 
whereas this year we asked them how they would describe their own health in general. So we kind of broadened the question a little bit, which may have left people willing to consider some other factors that could impact health. And this change is consistent with how the Center for Disease Control and Prevention asks a similar question in their survey where they had a lot, much larger population sample size. And you can see from the close alignment of the blue and purple bars on this slide that our data is pretty consistent with theirs. Now when we ask specifically about diet, a factor that influences health, we see that a little less than a quarter of Americans rate their diet as either extremely or very healthful. But when this data, what this data really shows us is that the majority of Americans, just over half, rate their diet as somewhat healthful. What's interesting about this question is that it, there appears to be a fairly strong trend related to age. Older Americans, ages 65 to 80, are more apt to report that their diet is very or extremely healthful, whereas younger Americans, ages 18 to 34, were more likely to say that their diet is not at all or not too healthful. So people feel good about their general health, yet they're less apt to say the same about their diet. With this in mind, it's not too surprising that people may be making dietary changes. There are a variety of reasons why consumers make dietary changes. Some just want to feel better and improve their overall well-being, while others may be trying to manage a specific health concern. Still, we know that many Americans are making these changes in an effort to manage their weight. From a public health perspective, this is a great thing. Still, the devil's in the details when it comes to how Americans measure up when it comes to balancing calories in and calories out. So before getting into our weight management findings, we thought it was important to point out how our pop study population compared to the national average. And again, you can see from the close alignment of the purple and the blue bars on this slide that our study population is fairly consistent with the CDC statistics. As the previous slides show, more than a third of adults are obese and even more are overweight. So it's encouraging to see that more than half of our survey respondents tell us that they're trying to lose weight. And the portion of Americans trying to lose weight increases with BMI from 32% of those with a low to normal BMI to 57% of those who are overweight and 76% of those who are obese. So the good news is the, those folks who we would expect should be making a stronger effort to manage their weight um, are, seem to be doing so according to our survey. Um, the 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans opened a new chapter for nutrition communications by shifting the focus from a healthy population to an at-risk, overweight, and obese population. And there are four cornerstone tenets to the new guidelines, including uh, focus on what we eat, the calories in, and then what we burn through physical activity, which is the calories outside. And our survey shows that nine out of 10 Americans have given either a lot or a little bit of thought to both sides of the energy balance equation. However, we know that weight loss doesn't just happen. We really need to help people become more conscious about both diet and physical activity in order to help them reach their health goals. And I'll demonstrate in just a minute that there may be a need to tailor energy balance messages different for men versus women. So here we asked Americans, which do you think is harder to do well consistently? Eat a healthful diet or get at least 30 minutes of physical activity? And what we found was a pretty even split, but when we go beyond that number and look at who's saying what, we see that men are far more likely to be challenged by consistently eating health, healthfully than remaining active. Meanwhile, the opposite is true for women. So this question provides good insights into our own communication and how we can tailor messages differently for these two audiences and reach them through unique partnerships. For example, if you're interested in working with men, it may be more advantageous to partner with a personal trainer or a gym to get better access to this group. So to gain a better understanding of how Americans fare when it comes to meeting the physical activity part, uh, guidelines, we've partnered with the Department of Health and Human Services to develop the next few questions. And in 2008, HHS released the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, which put a focus on both aerobic activity and strength training as key elements of physical health. Here we ask people to describe their level of physical activity. We provide a broad definition of physical activity, which includes everything from running and gardening to playing golf and dancing. While about two-thirds of Americans report being moderately or vigorously active, about one-third say that they are not at all active or sedentary. 
Well, I'm not going to present all the information that we asked um, related to physical activity. Um, we do ask them about how many days a week they're active and on those days how many minutes of physical activity we get in. That way we can get a fairly complete picture of their overall physical activity routines. Uh, one, one finding that I did want to share with you today was um, this finding around strength training. Regular physical activity provides benefits to so many different populations. Regular activity for children and adolescents promotes health and fitness. For adults who are physically active, um, they're more likely to have healthier lifestyles and less likely to develop chronic disease than adults who are inactive. They also have better fitness, including a healthier body size and composition. And for older Americans, regular physical activity is essential for healthy aging. As a mom of 13-month-old twins who weigh about 20 pounds each, I think a lot about my strength training and how important it is for me to keep up with my daily activities. Yet, results from our survey show that many people are missing the benefits that strength training provides. Only half of Americans who are physically active say that they engage in some form of strength training. When we encourage folks to become physically active, it's really important that we help them understand that it's not just about walking, although that's absolutely a great first step to helping people incorporate some form of physical activity. Um, but we also have to help them find ways to do muscle strengthening activities. Um, and if you're not comfortable providing this information to them, just be prepared to have other professionals to refer them to. As I mentioned earlier, this is just a snapshot of the questions that we asked about around physical activity. When we consider all of our questions together, we can compare people's reported behaviors with how well they're meeting the physical activity guidelines. And according to our survey, about one quarter of Americans are currently meeting the guidelines. Being sedentary, not um, meeting the minutes per week requirement, and or strength training are the key reasons why more than three-fourths of Americans are not currently meeting the guidelines. So we've talked a lot about the physical activity side of the energy balance equation, and in these next two slides, I'll help us better understand the calorie in side of the equation. So with this question, we wanted to understand Americans' belief that a calorie is a calorie when it comes to weight gain. This year, only three in 10 Americans correctly believe that all sources of calories play an equal role in weight gain. More people, 39%, told us that sugar and carbohydrates were more likely to lead to weight gain. Unfortunately, the prevailing nutrition communications environment tends to ebb and flow around a singular focus on one nutrient, and this has led, some led to some confusion about the role of fat, sugar, and carbohydrates as they relate to weight. In research that we conducted a few years ago with parents, we were trying to understand their receptivity to messages about calories, and we were very humbled by what we found. Some people asked us what a calorie is and what it does, while others flat out told us that no one ever taught them about calories. As nutrition communicators, we need to understand people's knowledge base when it comes to calories, as well as the misperceptions that they carry around, so that we can correct them in whatever way possible. Because a basic understanding of calories is important when it comes to weight. In fact, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommends that people have a general understanding of calories, yet only about one in seven correctly estimate the number of calories they need to maintain their weight. As a means to tackle the obesity epidemic, a lot of initiatives have been put in place that emphasize calories, including front of pack labeling and menu board labeling programs, as well as larger public health campaigns. We also know from our consumer research that calories are one of the top pieces of information that people look at on the Nutrition Facts panel, yet the responses to this question have to make us pause and consider if people are accurately utilizing calorie information in an effort to manage their weight. The calorie message is further complicated by other recommendations to ensure that we're meeting our nutritional needs within our daily calorie requirements. So that's almost math on top of math, which we know is, can be challenging for many consumers. So it's not too surprising that people are confused when fundamental information that often we take for granted, like daily calorie needs, are not easily understood by the vast majority of consumers. The good news is, is that there are a lot of programs like MyPlate and mobile apps that can really help people in their effort to understand calories and track their progress towards achieving energy balance. What it all comes down to is that people need overall guidance about how to live a healthful lifestyle that includes both diet and physical activity. So this may require us to partner with unique groups, 
tailor our communications differently and for various audiences so that we make dietary guidance easier for them, especially as it relates to physical activity and calories. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marianne to talk a little bit more about some information sources that people are using to um, build their diet. Thank you, Liz. And as, as Liz mentioned, Americans are taking some small steps to improve their diet. As with previous years, we have collaborated with USDA, Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion, to really seek insights on the dietary guidelines. And this year, based on the 2010 Dietary Guidelines communication messages, we asked consumers what they have actually tried to do over the past year. And the good news is that we see about 90% say that they are trying to eat more fruits and vegetables. And at least 75% are trying to eat smaller portions, or eat more whole grains, or cut back on foods higher in fats, sugar, and salt, and cut calories with lower calorie be beverages. We see women more than men are actually likely to have taken action as, those, as well as those with more formal education. So this does show that even though people are trying to take uh, small steps, there are some definite gap gaps in some of the uh, specific populations. To gauge the effectiveness um, of the new dietary guidelines uh, symbol, my plate, we, uh, we definitely we showed consumers the my plate graphic and then followed with a series of messages. And the good news is the majority of consumers agreed that the my plate graphic did reinforce the message of eating a variety of food groups for a balanced and healthful diet. A good news story for the first year of, of birthday of my plate. And this year, as Liz mentioned, we ask about the use of online and mobile tools. And we see that six out of 10 believe that tools can help them. And not surprising, even though that the younger generation definitely were more receptive, we also found that baby boomers were almost as equally as receptive to using mobile tools. So we may look at that technology actually may be the lifestyle coach of the future. We know that consumers are making a variety of food and nutrition decisions through a variety of lenses. And to, do, to provide more insight on some overall um, health decisions and food decisions, I'm turning it over to Lindsay Loving to give us the insight. Thanks, Marianne. So another overarching issue, as Marianne mentioned, that is pervasive across food and nutrition issues is the concept of sustainability. Like mobile technology, this buzz topic has been on an upward trend and is beginning to factor into consumers' food and beverage choices. Two-thirds of consumers say they have given some thought to whether their foods and beverages are produced in a sustainable way. And according to IFIC's 2012 Consumer Perceptions of Food Technology Survey released last month, consumers define sustainability as being longer lasting, not running out, and having a longer shelf life. Others attribute consistency to sustainable foods, and a smaller percentage say sustainable foods don't have an impact on the environment. The Food Technology Survey also found that the majority of consumers, 70%, say that it is important to them that their foods and beverages are produced in a sustainable way. However, we found that only about one-third are willing to pay more for foods that fit their definition of sustainability. Now, we didn't mention sustainability in this question. However, some things that we see people report doing regularly include buying foods and beverages that are advertised as local, buying foods and beverages at farmer's markets, and buying foods and beverages in recycled and or recyclable packaging. We can see that only about 22% report growing their own food regularly, um, which we know with today's busy lifestyles isn't really realistic. And um, a lower percentage report activities that represent other pillars of sustainability, including the economic and social pillars, which are often secondary to the environment or environmental uh, pillar in consumers' minds but still play a significant role in the sustainability of our food. And sustainability and processing don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. In this question regarding statements about processed foods, 48% of consumers agreed that processed foods can be produced in a sustainable way. 
In fact, some processed foods are among the most sustainable foods. Top aspects consumers agree with regarding processed foods include that food processing can help foods stay fresh longer, uh, can help provide a variety of food choices year round, can be a convenient way uh, for them to put food on the table, and can be healthful choices. Um, less consumers, about 37%, um, found or agreed that processed foods can provide added health benefits. So this is an opportunity for communication. Um, for example, as we know, whole, whole wheat bread is a processed food with clear health benefits. But because of negative associations with the term process, we need to be cl clear when communicating that while most foods are processed, not all foods are created equal. Similar to processed foods, most Americans also believe food additives can extend freshness of certain foods and act as a preservative. Um, there are opportunities for communication um, around the rest of the statements of functions of food additives, particularly um, looking at the functions of food additives to improve food safety, such as protecting us from harmful foodborne bacteria that can make us sick, uh, including through the use of preservatives. There are also opportunities to communicate about how food additives are regulated in the U.S., especially the two bottom statements here about setting allowable daily intakes and the involvement of non-government scientists and experts uh, in the food additive review and approval process to help improve consumer understanding of how regulatory agencies such as FDA keep the food supply safe and ensure the safety of food additives. Regarding food colors, more consumers this year understand the role of food colors in improving the appearance and appeal of their foods than in previous years. Regarding regulation of food colors, higher percentages understand statements about the labeling and approval of food colors. However, there is still confusion around the relationship between food colors and hyperactivity in children and mixed messages and conflicting information are likely leading to this confusion. So it's important to provide clear and strong messages regarding the safety of food colors and the science on these ingredients. You can also guide consumers on reading food labels when talking about ingredients as they are required to be listed on the label. And now Marianne is going to talk with you more about additional insights regarding food labeling. Thank you, Lindsay. As in previous years, we always ask consumers what information do they really look at on the food and beverage uh, package. And surprisingly this year, uh, expiration date was a significant first choice, which has always been very close to the Nutrition Fact Panel, but this is the first time we've ever seen the expiration date. So we look at it as probably a value proposition and the possibility that more individuals are buying uh, fresher foods, more of the fresh foods that would have expiration dates. And th so ensuring the value for their purchase as well as the safety has become really important. But it's closely followed by the nutrition fact panel as well. What I think is interesting, if you'll note also, is that where we have asked about the calorie and other nutrition information on the front of pack via the icon or the graphic. And even though this is an ex exactly the way it was asked last year, but very close, we see a significant gain in people really looking at items that are on the front of the pack. In fact, last year, about 24% said that was definitely information they used, and you see this year it has jumped to 48%. Again, we, we definitely see those um, are, are looking at um, those, many of them, the older, um, those who are older are definitely seeing ingredients being very important lists as well as the expiration date. But regardless of looking at what's on the package and all the other lenses that we've talked about and we'll talk about throughout the rest of the presentation, the reality is, is that taste still rules when it comes to consumers uh, selecting food and beverage choices. For the seventh year straight, taste, and, and, and really it's, it's consistent, over 87% say that taste is important. And last year, even though we saw a significant increase in price, this year's pretty consistent. Still about uh, over 70% say price is important, and then it's followed by helpfulness, convenience, and sustainability. And so I think the key is that um, last we see a little decline in the sustainability factor from last year, 
And it could be from the fact of what Lindsay has mentioned earlier, is that even though sustainability is important, it's not uh, something that individuals are actually going to pay for. So when we look at the, um, at the uh, trends here, we see that uh, really looking down from an age, not surprisingly, that taste and healthfulness become even more important as we age. So those that are in the 65 to 80s, that is the most important. Where price definitely is most important for those 18 um, to uh, 35 and 40, and especially to those that I work with that in the age group, they tell me that's, that's definitely a, a correct. So you can see is that taste and price still rule when it comes to looking at helpfulness and convenience. And we definitely need to take that in consideration when we uh, counsel uh, patients and work with nutrition education, but it gives us a chance to really understand the broad picture. So now to really talk a little more about some of the dietary components and what consumers understand, I'm now turning it over to Ann Bouchou. Oh, sorry, I'm now turning it over to Elizabeth Rahabi. <laughs> Thanks, Mary Ann. <clears throat> so over the past year, we wanted to understand how much thought people were giving to those various food components and ingredients that are in the foods and beverages that they are buying. And what we found is that nine out of 10 respondents told us that they have given either a little or a lot of thought to the ingredients in their foods and beverages. Only 9% say that they haven't given a lot of thought to this. So what are people thinking about when making decisions about buying foods and beverages? Well, calories are number one. And this is followed closely by whole grains, fiber, sugars, sodium, and fats and oils. More than half consider trans fat, protein, saturated fats, and vitamins and minerals, while just under half of Americans are thinking about uh, high fructose corn syrup, mono and polyunsaturated fats, low calorie sweeteners, calcium, and caffeine. And what's also interesting about this finding is that we find that older consumers, um, especially in that 65 to 80 age group, are more likely to consider these food components as well as women and um, highly educated consumers with uh, a college degree or higher are more interested in um, these various components in their foods and beverages. This slide is a continuation of the previous one and it shows some other food components that people are thinking about when making decisions about buying foods and beverages. The data shown here indicates that there's a really big educational opportunity to enhance understanding of certain food components that can benefit health like omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, potassium, and probiotics. And in fact, our Functional Foods, Foods for Health survey demonstrates that people really are interested in learning more about the benefits that food can provide. So on this slide, we wanted to find out a little bit more about people's reported behaviors when it comes to those different um, food ingredients that people are looking for when buying foods and beverages. And what we see here is that people are actually doing a lot in regards to um, various food components. On the left side, which is the green bar, you can see uh, that is the trying to avoid categories. And then on the right side, those are people who are saying that they're trying to consume more of certain food components. Whole grains, fiber, and protein um, are the messages that have definitely gotten through to consumers about what they should be, what they should be eating more of. Um, and in the avoid column, uh, around half of the respondents indicate that they're trying to consume less calories, fats, sugar, sodium, trans, saturated fat, and high fructose corn syrup. The 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans put a renewed emphasis on the role of protein in the American diet, and we asked a few questions to get a better understanding of how Americans fare when it comes to their um, understanding of protein and their reported behaviors. Um, while protein's presence was previously limited in dietary guidance, um, it's really left us with a great educational opportunity to talk with consumers more about the benefits that foods and beverages containing protein can provide. And that's nicely demonstrated on this slide. While more than 8 out of 10 Americans understand that protein can build muscle and is part of a balanced diet, only, two third under, uh, only around two-thirds understand the role of protein as it relates to weight management. 
about 41% of Americans strongly agree that it's easy for them to incorporate protein foods into their diet, while others get caught up with the perceived expense of foods that contain protein. And what we found is that those with a low household income, younger consumers, Hispanic and obese individuals are more likely um, to indicate that um, it's more difficult to consume protein because of its expense. So there's a real opportunity for us to provide messages that highlight the continuum of protein containing foods and beverages from animal, plant, seafood, and dairy based sources with an eye towards maximizing how Americans spend their food dollars. Um, this question was only asked to people who are trying to consume more protein. We wanted to know what sources they're currently trying to consume. And what we found is that poultry, nuts and seeds, and eggs were the top three sources mentioned by respondents. More than a quarter of Americans mentioned, or more than a quor three quarters of Americans mentioned beef, cheese, and fish, while more than two thirds cited yogurt, milk, and beans. Other less mentioned sources included pork, cereal, deli meat, protein bars, soy protein shakes, and supplements. Um, Protein needs and recommendations do change throughout the life cycle, and they're also based on individual needs. So we wanted to understand a little bit better um, if the American public thinks that there are certain um, parts of the population that need to be particularly more conscious about their protein intake. And what we found is that most Americans have heard that athletes need to have a higher, um, may have higher protein needs. But what's particularly surprising about this question is that children and people under age 55, um, or people over the age of 55, um, are at the bottom of this chart. And uh, men are less likely to prioritize protein needs for women, children, and older adults. So there's a real need to provide some individual um, as well as tailored recommendations that really help to reinforce the value of protein in uh, the diets, particularly of women, um, children under 12, and uh, people ages 55 and older. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Ann Bouchou, to talk through some other um, macronutrients and um, nutrients within the diet. Thanks very much, Liz. And hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I bet you're about ready for a seventh inning stretch here. <laughs> so, you know, when we look at dietary fats, we're talking about an evolving issue. Science tells us that we should consume more of the beneficial fats, but the media and all of our collective memories tell us or imply that to eat fat is to be fat. So a lot of folks take that to mean avoid fat in any form. The low fat mantra from the 1990s is still with us as you see from the in the following survey questions. And you know, when we're going through this data on all of these issues, uh, if you would like to uh, look at the details and the, and the data more carefully, that information will be on our website for you to look at after this presentation is over. So uh, when we ask the question, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following about whether they're trying to consume more or little dietary fats, uh, two-thirds tell us that they're trying to consume as little fat as possible. 22% say they believe all types of fat have the same impact on health. And this provides an opportunity to build on their understanding of beneficial fats. And this is where the evolution comes in, and this is also where you, the health communicator, comes in to help uh, bridge that gap. When we also asked, to what extent do you try to consume to consume or avoid the following, and it lists uh, the various different fats and oils, we see that only 9% of the respondents said that they're trying to consume more mono and polyunsaturated fats. It's really clear that this presents a big and important opportunity to enhance consumers' knowledge about these healthful fats. We've learned in previous consumer research that if we emphasize the un in unsaturated, we can really help people to understand which dietary fats are the ones to include more of. And I think that we're all struggling with how to take this uh, many syllable, these many syllable words and try to help consumers understand where they are and why they're so important to include. And this is a great opportunity for you to uh, be able to do that. 
the next question we asked was, uh, what if any of the following are the reasons why you consider the fat content of foods and beverages you buy? And we've seen that weight management is the reason most respondents selected for why they make changes and consider the amount of fats in foods. Uh, they also point out that re reducing the risk of heart disease and reducing the risk of future health conditions are next in importance in consumers' minds. So turning to sodium, uh, sodium and salt are on the minds of consumers who say they want to limit or avoid uh, sodium in their diet. And when we asked how they try to limit sodium, most say they never add salt to food. 37% say they purchase low sodium products, and that's almost the same percentage who said they did so in 2011. I think one of the interesting things about uh, their response as in to the highest number say that they're trying to limit uh, adding salt to their food, and that's probably one of the least uh, important ways that one can uh, monitor and manage the sodium content of the diet. So again, uh, to, to reiterate, uh, there's a great opportunity for education there. Uh, the large majority of Americans have normal blood pressure, although for nearly one in four, this is achieved with the help of medication. Um, this data is interesting because it does show clearly that uh, a lot of folks are taking medication to control their blood pressure, and this, of course, rises with advancing age. At the bottom of these uh, responses, we see that 4% don't know or are unsure of what their blood pressure is, and this is an important uh, point for health professionals to be aware of, especially for uh, the younger individuals between the ages of 18 and 34. Their knowledge and probably interest in blood pressure uh, may need to be enhanced, and along with that, uh, probably understanding of what those numbers mean. It's uh, very dis difficult to understand what systolic and diastolic means, and what do the numbers mean, and are, is it supposed to be higher or lower? So uh, along with helping people to manage their blood pressure, uh, I think it's also helpful to help them understand what they're uh, dealing with. So for the people whose blood pressure is high or normal because they take medication, almost 8 in 10 do take their medication. Only 17% follow an eating plan such as the DASH diet, and this is an educational opportunity for healthcare providers to help patients take blood pressure management into their own hands through diet and lifestyle. In sodium research uh, we conducted with consumers in 2011, we found very similar results, although the questions were asked somewhat differently. The question, which of the following have you ever done specifically to reduce your blood pressure to keep it from getting higher, was asked of people whose blood pressure is normal without medication. Uh, so what we heard was that about one quarter took steps to improve overall health through diet and lifestyle changes, but one half say that they've done nothing at all. And uh, this is a, a, a great opportunity to emphasize the fact that uh, the DASH diet is great to recommend for overall health, not just for managing blood pressure. Uh, the question for what reasons are you making these efforts to manage your blood pressure? And personal responsibility rules here, and that's a great sign. Even among those with normal blood pressure without medication, among those with blood pressure whose blood pressure is high or normal with medication, 57% say their doctor directly told them to manage their blood pressure. But next to the bottom response, not the very bottom one, but uh, next to the bottom response, uh, we see that uh, people often make decisions about their diet and health based on what they've heard or read that resonates with them personally. This ties in with personal responsibility, but of course not all people read or hear what is accurate. And as health professionals, all of you on this webcast provide very helpful information that can really benefit your audiences, consumers, and patients. 
So now and finally we come to carbohydrates and sugars, the nutrients consumers seem to hear the most about. Of the 723 people who think about the presence or absence of sugars or carbs in the foods and beverages they buy, six out of 10 cite weight management as the reason they give consideration to these nutrients. A little over half say they do it to avoid future health considerations or conditions. And as we've seen with many of the other diet and health issues we discuss here, older people are more likely than younger people to consider this. When asked which of the following statements are true, uh, the top three all are higher in 2012 than they were in 2011. But in uh, at the bottom two showed that in 2011 and 2012, the same percent of survey respondents agreed that all sugars are used by the body in the same way. So, uh, so we are seeing that some things are growing in awareness and uh, some things are staying the same, but uh, the good news is that uh, people are becoming more aware and uh, understanding that sugars do have a role in a healthful diet. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over again to Lindsay, who will discuss the survey's findings with regard to consumers' knowledge and behavior when it comes to low-calorie sweeteners. Thanks, Anne. Regarding agreement with various statements about the roles and benefits of low-calorie sweeteners, there was a return to historical norms this year, as you'll see in the far right column. Uh, the top three statements there show that four in 10 consumers uh, agree that low calorie sweeteners are an option for people with diabetes, can reduce the calorie content of foods, and can play a role in weight loss or weight management. Also, if you look at the second line from the bottom, significantly fewer consumers this year said that they didn't agree with any of the statements. Confusing and conflicting information on low calorie sweeteners has led to confusion and made it difficult to know what to do. Information on the efficacy of low calorie sweeteners for weight management, calorie control, as well as options for people with diabetes should be communicated so consumers can make informed decisions. Of those who are not trying to avoid low calorie sweeteners, 73% uh, say they are consuming them to reduce the total number of calories they are consuming, not surprisingly. Next, 37% say they consume them to prevent a future health condition, while 29% use them to manage an existing health condition, and 23% say they just prefer the taste. Now, although we've been talking a lot about nutrients and nutrition, you can't have a nutritious food without it first being safe. So now I'm going to turn it over to Katie Burns to review the food safety questions from this year's survey. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and thank you all of us for sticking with us throughout this webcast. Just a reminder to send any questions that you have based on the findings that we've discussed today, or also any insights, to the email address foodandhealth at ific.org. As Lindsay mentioned, we like to say here at the International Food Information Council Foundation that food cannot be nutritious unless it's safe. So it's certainly heartening to see that 85% of Americans have given a lot or a little thought to this to food safety over the past year. And it's increasingly heartening to see that more than three quarters of Americans are confident in the safety of our country's food supply. And while this question changed slightly from last year, we've seen consistently over the past six years that about half of Americans report being at least somewhat confident. So this year we did see a considerable increase in those Americans who report being confident in the safety of our US food supply. So keeping that in mind, it's not surprising to see that, again, the majority of Americans agree that the chances they'll be sickened by their food are extremely low. Because they're so confident, they don't see this as a concerning issue. But for those of us who are communicating about nutrition and food safety, it's important that we get the message out there about safe food practices, such as cleaning, separating, cooking, and chilling. And in the month of September during Food Safety Education Month, we'll go into some more details about the findings of food safety from our Food and Health Survey. But before I wind down on this food safety information, I wanted to let you know that um, we asked the question, how um, well are the various entities who are responsible for food safety doing? 
and we found that the vast majority, almost all of Americans, believe that the person who's preparing most of the food in their home actually does the best job at ensuring the safety of their food. That's followed closely by farmers and producers, then retailers, food manufacturers, food service establishments, and finally the government. And it is again heartening to see that at least all of these entities are perceived as doing at least a good job. This question changed slightly from years past where we asked who was responsible for food safety. And again, we know that Americans are getting the message that food safety is a shared responsibility. But as we move forward to talk with our um, clients, patients, and the American public about nutrition and food safety, we do need to remember to incorporate those basic food safety messages of cleaning, separating, cooking, and chilling when we address food and health information. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mary Ann Smithedge, who will give us a brief summary and wrap up before we address your questions. As a reminder, please send any and all questions to foodandhealth at ific.org. Thank you, Katie. I think as you have listened to all the different insights, you, we all can agree that we really have talked about food through many lenses today, hence possibly why the, the confusion that the consumer express. But we know that food does play a variety of roles in our life. If we think about it, we associate certain foods with family celebration, holidays, and just good times. And so hence when we ask the question this year, is that about would they rather just enjoy their food than worry too much about what's in it, you can see that well over 50% say that enjoying their food is extremely important. And so I think when we talk about communications, we have to put it in the context of how it is from a cultural standpoint as, as well as looking at it from a healthful lifestyle. But if you look at the last um, uh, statement there, I think it gives us a great opportunity. The door is open. Because the good news is that over 80% said, you know, I would definitely rather think about changing my lifestyle than really taking the medication for health. Which is a good news because a lot of times we think people are looking only for a silver, silver bullet or just saying, let me just take a medication and not have to worry about doing it. So in the context, when we as nut nutrition educators, health educators really look we have to realize is that food has a multiple uh, lens and plays multiple roles in individuals' lives. And from that, we have to build upon to really talk about how to change lifestyle. So in, in summary, when we really look at it, is that our call to action as health professionals, nutrition educators, is to really take a, a deep breath and, un and understand what did we say today? And like taxes, food and health information is complex to understand. And in order to move the needle, we must earn consumers' trust. In other words, we need to meet consumers where they are, not where we think they should be. And we have to think beyond our current nutrition communication platform if we are to achieve the goal of first demystifying the complexity of the message and ultimately motivate consumers to adopt helpful, lifelong behavioral changes. I think every year when we get the survey, the reality is it gives us a lot to think about and realize that we continue to need to dive in to understand where consumers are now, and it gives us the basis for which we can build the framework to really motivate them. I thank you for your time today, and now I'm looking forward to input from each of you, and I'll turn it over to Katie for, uh, answer, for moderating the question and answers. Thank you, Mary Ann, and thank you to all of you who have submitted questions. Again, if you have any burning questions, please send them via email to the email address foodandhealth at ific.org. Our first question today seems to be posed to all of the speakers, and that is, what would you say is the most surprising finding from this year's survey, and how does that compare to past years? This isn't the first time I've been asked this question, <laughs> and I'm always, I always, am, this is Mary Ann, I, I always uh, pause because I think when we look at it, it, first of all, we're probably not surprised by some of the answers. 
But I think that the reality is one of the questions that I mentioned um, initially is that when we ask consumers really to look at, you know, who did they believe in credible choices, is that the reality is that science is not necessarily the, the top. It's that, is that they're looking um, at sources that they are researched. And I think it goes back to some focus groups that we've done with previous uh, 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 surveys over the last se um, several months that has really resonated with me because in a, in a focus group we asked um, moms particularly, you know, who did they believe or what did they think information was credible. And basically they said, you know, if I see it written the same way in a multitude of times, I actually believe one mom said five times, then I know that it must be true. And so I think it's mindful for us that says consistency in messaging is really important. But to understand that sometimes as, as a nutritional health professional, that may not always be um, the first line of defense, but it gives it, but we have to realize that uh, we still have an opportunity to try to, to educate, but that we must be able to communicate our message in a multitude of, of sources and venues. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to echo a little bit of what Marianne said and something that we found um, over a number of surveys, which is, one, how few Americans actually know how many calories they need in a day, which um, you know has been a humbling finding since we first asked the question back in 2006, and I think it continues to be humbling today, um, particularly as it relates to a question that we asked in our 2011 survey to people who are making dietary changes in an effort to manage their weight, what resources are they using? And over a third said that they weren't, and this was the number one response, said that they weren't using any particular resource in an effort to manage their weight, but they were doing something. So they really were looking at weight and weight management and, and changing their diet as kind of a do-it-yourself project. And I think that that really tells us that there's a, an important role for us to, as Marianne said, to gain consumers' trust, to help them recognize that we are just like them and, and, they're, and, and trying to, you know, achieve a better health status and that, um, you know, with the right tips and strategies and advice that, that we too can help them get to where they want to be. Oh, hi, this is Ann. I just want to reinforce everything that uh, uh, everyone has said, but I wanted to return to that astonishing and, and very enlightening fact that for us, those of us who work in nutrition every day, we know that the uh, re recommendations are complex and sometimes a little difficult to understand, but the very vivid visual uh, that consumers tell us they find that nutrition and health information is more difficult to understand than doing their taxes. Wow, that really gives us an opportunity to realize that we really have to meet consumers where they are. And that's something that uh, we think about and, and try to do on a daily basis. But when we realize there's such a gap between uh, what those of us uh, who are in this game know quite well and the people we're trying to talk to, it is important to remember those taxes and try to be a little bit more concrete and specific. Thank you so much, Anne, Marianne, and Liz. And I'm just going to add a little bit to that. This is Katie. I think, again, while we need to meet consumers where they are, part of that is recognizing and acknowledging that they are trying to make changes and that they are thinking about these issues on a somewhat regular basis, with, again, 9 and 10 saying that they've given it at least a little thought over the past year. So again, as we move forward, we need to keep in mind and give them credit for taking small steps to improve the healthfulness of their diet and their lifestyle. Um, we had a question come in related to food safety, and the question is, it was mentioned that consumers are increasingly confident in food safety. Are there any insights that we may have on the drivers of this confidence, and is it because of better education or lower incidences? And I must say, I'm, we don't have any data in our survey this year to indicate why that confidence level has gone up. Although again, over the past five or six years that we've asked the question, We've seen it consistent that the majority of Americans remain confident despite um, food safety incidences, whether it's chemical contamination or foodborne illness outbreaks. So while we don't have specific information, I do think that part of that is relevant related to that they trust themselves and that they believe they're doing the best job, and also that very few believe that they will personally get sick from foodborne illness. 
Um, next up, we have a question related to front of pack labeling and the effectiveness of it. I know Marianne had touched on this when she was going over one of our data slides about um, a comparison to last year's data when it comes to front of pack labeling. So I'll pass it over to Marianne to address that. Well, in the quest, in this particular survey, all, all it mentioned was really um, when they looked at the, uh, the, the packaging, did they basically uh, address those particular issues? And so one of the things here is that we do see is that what are they looking at on the front of the package, as I mentioned, is that um, since we mentioned it was the front of pack information or icon, that you know closer to 50% say that, that they are looking at it. Um, we don't have a lot of other insight in that regard. I, I would say, as I mentioned earlier, is that last year uh, uh, almost the, the same uh, phrase was used and it was 24%. And I would say part of it is because there has been more front of pack um, icons appear over the past year. So at least there's a recognition to whether or not uh, they're using it, we don't know. Um, 2010, we, have, uh, we did some research uh, some initial research on looking at front of pack, and we did see where consumers uh, were seemed to have a good understanding in that regard. But um, that's something that we'll probably look into um, uh, over the next year. Another question that um, is that do I uh, was asked is do do I think people are reading labels more? Um, you know, I, I think people are reading labels to say. Um, it's always, it's always a question, are they reading them and are they using them? I think what's kind of interesting here is that uh, up until this year, the Nutrition Fact Panel was al always the most widely uh, uh, utilized uh, information on, on, you know, on the, uh, you know, on the food package. And so, as I mentioned earlier, possibly why it was, um, uh, came in second this year over expiration date is that individuals are actually looking at more fresh items that might have expiration dates and that becomes the first important. So we know people are, you know, um, are, are, are reading labels, but then again, it comes back to are they really understanding them? And I think, it, you know, some of that could be is the complexity of even the calorie question and some of the other ones that have been raised on reading but understanding and actual implementation. I can give one caveat is in, a, in a, some previous uh, focus groups we did in surveys when we, I, it resonated with me just something on labeling was that um, an individual uh, said that they, uh, a, a serving size is what was on, you know, what was on the, pack, on the package, but a portion is what was served to them. So I, I think again when we think a lot of times what they see and how they implement it and really understand, we know that uh, there's still room for improvement. Thank you so much, Marianne, for those insights. Um, we have a question related to the physical activity, and it's a question related to, do we have any thoughts on how consumers, how much time consumers are spent thinking about diet and exercise? And then again, the definition of moderately active versus vigorously active. So I'm gonna turn this over to Liz, who addressed those issues. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, you know, in terms of answering your first question about how much thought people give to physical activity, um, you know, we did have that one question in our survey that um, specifically asked, you know, how much time folks have given to thinking about um, their diet as well as their level of physical activity, and we saw that about 9 out of 10 do give some thought to that. Um, in terms of how we define vigorously active versus moderately active, um, it was um, I believe it was self-report by the participant um, categorizing themselves that way. Um, but then we also do ask questions about how much they're active um, and how many days a week they are active so that we can get an idea overall of um, their physical activity um, um, goals. It looks like I have another question here um, to provide some clarity on how BMI was determined for the survey takers. Um, it is self-reported height and weight that is um, provided by the, per by the respondents, and then we use their self-reported height and weight and do the um, number <coughs> crunching to come up with their BMI. 
Um, so it's uh, self-report and then us actually doing the formula to get that number. That's great. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, we have, we've had a couple questions coming in related to sugars. So the question is, regarding the question on all sugars are the same, we saw that 28% agreed with this in 2011, and it was 28% again in 2012. So as nutrition communicators, what are our opportunities to help this number? Well, this is Anne. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I think when you ask the question, how do we fix this, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but if, if you mean how could we improve uh, people's understandings that sugars uh, basically are uh, treated the same by the body, I just think that that is an opportunity for uh, bringing down the level of concern about sugars overall. Uh, folks have heard a lot of, of uh, things about sugars, they're not sure what to believe, and so going back to the basics and just talking about uh, the fact that, that, that all sugars really are managed by the body about the same, and so there's really not any cause for alarm or concern about any one of uh, sugars as, as folks consume them in moderation in a healthful diet. And I think in regards to sugars too, it's important in putting in, 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 in context the, the overall reality of, uh, of weight management and, and lifestyle and, and recognizing, I think, as Liz mentioned earlier about, you know, the calorie versus the calorie concept and, you know, that there is still some confusion and maybe a little bit more of understanding the calorie, calorie and, and looking at the source. And I think it does give us an opportunity to really uh, kind of explain the overall um, energy balance uh, message. That's great, Marianne and Anne. Thank you so much again. And thank you to all of you who have submitted questions. In the interest of time, we are just going to have time for one more question, and that'll allow us the opportunity to close out. So this question, again, is to all of the speakers. What other communications platforms may be helpful as we move forward to help, again, bridge that gap between consumer understanding and lifelong behavior? Sure, this is Liz, and I'm happy to take that question on. Um, in terms of other platforms that are available for us to um, reach out and connect, uh, one of the things I would say is, you know, as Marianne mentioned, when people are looking for what information is credible, they're really looking at that information coming from a variety of sources. So I think that as much as we can partner with other um, organizations or um, health professionals so that we're providing some consistency in our messaging, um, that's one really important um, communication platform that we can use is the, the power of partnerships and consistency in messaging. And I believe one of my other colleagues is probably gonna talk to the value of social media as well. And Liz would, would give it to me, this is Marianne, being that I'm the queen of social media, and, 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 and <laughs> is that, uh, that's kind of an inside joke, but anyway. <laughs> uh, the reality is, I, I think it, what we've talked about is that uh, I, I definitely believe just from the fact of monitoring the blogs, and, um, uh, and we've been tweeting today, and the key is uh, the importance of going back to meeting consumers where they are. And uh, it's very apparent, and of course we have a lot of nutritional professional and, and health educators that are playing in the social media space, so to speak. And it, it is of great value because we find that it is the social media uh, venues many times that the word one gets out faster, and two, that's the one uh, that's being used most frequently. But we also know that in that context of communicating is that uh, of the world of tweets and sound bites, we have to be uh, very in tune to understanding that, it, and I guess put it in context, that we want simple, consistent messages, but not to make them so simple that, uh, that the overall, um, I guess, context of, of the message gets lost, and, and hence why it may seem simple, but sometimes why people get confused, because um, it's a little more difficult than, than uh, you know, a 
so many characters, so to speak. But I believe we have to also then make sure that a couple other things, I think, with messaging is really know who your audience is. Mm -hmm. uh, because many times I, I always say is that, you know, if we do a message, you know, for everyone, then basically it's for no one. And I think in, in our society that's uh, continuing to be more culturally diverse, uh, we have to make sure that um, our messaging re is resonates with that particular uh, client and, and making sure that it's a client, whether it's age, ethnicity, uh, or so forth. So again, honing in on who uh, our message is. I think, frankly, from one surprise, and not surprising, but I'll just say on messaging, uh, it's obvious from, from just this survey that um, you know we, we've got an opportunity to really hone in our messaging for males because uh, it does seem that for a lot of those key messages that um, the male gender is it's not it's just not resonating and I'll also uh, reiterate Marianne's point this is Lindsay about meeting consumers where they are and just from personal experience, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have experienced it as well, that where people are is on their phones. Um, and I know that when I go to look for, look something up or look for a piece of information, I'm going to my smartphone to surf the web or text a friend or send an email. And you can do this all from your phone now. And on any given day when I'm walking down the street here in DC, people aren't talking to each other anymore. They're just staring down at their phones. <laughs> so I definitely think that it's important that uh, we have we have communications that can be received and read and um, understood well using this mobile technology and I think that calls even more for this uh, concise and clear mm -hmm. communication so that it comes through and it's not just through using apps but direct communication with your patients and your clients uh, through this medium is going to continue to be an important uh, communication channel that we should all be utilizing. That's great. Thank you, everybody. And um, this is Katie. I'm just going to add my two cents in as well. And I think it's important that as we move forward, we try to break down those walls between the us and them. While a lot of us are experts and in our fields of nutrition, food safety, and communications, we need to remember that we are also consumers and we are also Americans and that every day we have the opportunity to influence those around us, um, both by our own behaviors, but also just having candid conversations. I think, again, the more we can relate to consumers, the more likely it is that we'll, we'll be able to earn their trust. And again, just helping them understand who we are and that um, you know it's a challenge for everybody and we're, sort of, we're all in this together. I think that'll really help us make, um, move that needle when it comes to behavior change. Um, we just have one last quick question, and I apologize that we haven't been able to get to all of your questions. We are really trying to focus on those ones that our data can help us answer. But this question is very interesting given the last one talking about social media. And it is how consistent are the findings of our 2012 food and health survey with what we have observed on blogs, tweets, and other social media platforms? Well, thank, this is Mary Ann. Um, and I'll, I'll start the um, question is that obviously uh, we, we definitely monitor blogs and tweets. And even though we don't have data that would um, maybe uh, match it exactly. You know, I, I, I do go back to the fact that, you know, looking at the variety of information that comes out on blogs and tweets, and sometimes um, all information, of course, is not consistent in the same message, uh, I would say at least it gives me um, a reason and the, and, and the context behind why three out of four Americans say that there's so much information out there they don't really know what uh, to believe and that it is confusing because we know that depending on, you know, um, the author of the blog or the tweet, you know, it, the information uh, can be one way versus another, and it's not necessarily always science-based. And so, you know, that does lend itself to the confusion um, or, or just not really knowing what is, you know, what is the correct answer. So I think that's a reality that we as, as educators and professionals need to realize and just to look um, how we can help uh, basically provide the consistency and message and lessen sometimes the uh, confusion of the headlines. 
And I would uh, just echo a little bit of what Marianne said with um, some, own obs some of my own observations and, um, you know, looking at kind of the communication environment as it exists via social media. And I think what we see sometimes is that sometimes the most uh, persuasive message when it comes to nutrition communication isn't always the most science-based message and um, that I think is a big point in which we all need to be involved in the social media space to ensure that we are providing that science-based messaging that um, that consumers can relate to so that it is practical um, to the lifestyles that they're leading today and uh, to that end Ithic is actually very involved in social media we are tweeting about this webcast today uh, we also have a blog Blog that we publish um, at least two or three times a week on our website. We have an electronic newsletter that you can keep up with. Um, so we're very active in this space and enjoy making new friends all the time on Facebook and Twitter. So feel free to follow us. I think that when it comes to the survey as well as um, the social media that we definitely see that what people say can often be different from what they do. Um, but going back to our question in the survey about you know, top factors when making food and beverage decisions, you know, taste is king, um, and that has continued to be consistent over the years, and consumers value very highly taste, convenience, um, and health factors when it comes to the foods and beverages they're choosing. Um, so I think that we just have to keep in mind that in the end, it still has to taste good, it still has to be affordable, um, and it still has to contribute to the health and wellness of them and their families. Thank you everybody and thank you to all who have submitted questions. I think we had a great robust discussion today. Um, for those of you, we've had a couple emails asking if these slides will be available after the event. We will be posting these slides approximately one hour after the conclusion of today's webcast in PDF format and they can be found at our website www.foodinsight.org and don't be afraid for those of you who may have missed bits and pieces of the webcast because this is just our first webcast in the year um, to highlight our 2012 food and health survey. Um, coming up in July we'll have an additional webcast. As I mentioned before leading up to the month of September Food Safety Education Month we will be doing a webcast featuring our findings on food safety and as we get into the holiday season, we'll be talking a little bit more in detail about weight management and energy balance. And as Liz mentioned, we do have our Food Insight newsletter, which is an e-newsletter. And I encourage you all to sign up for that if you haven't already. That is how we send out our invitations for these webcasts and upcoming events. As I mentioned, the executive summary and the full report of our 2012 Food and Health Survey will be available on our website, www.foodinsight.org backslash food and health 2012.aspx as well as a PDF of today's presentation. Liz also mentioned that we are active on Twitter. We've been live tweeting throughout today's webcast through both at Ithic Media and at Food Insight. And today's hashtag was food and health and we encourage you and invite you to join that conversation. Um, those of you, as we mentioned earlier, this is our seventh year of doing our food and health survey. And we actually have recently published, or have in line to be published, two retrospectives, one related to food safety, and one more on the nutrition and health findings. Our food safety retrospective has been published in the Journal of Food Protection Trends, and our five-year retrospective on the American attitudes towards food, nutrition, and health is set to be published in the Journal of the, Ameri uh, the, Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I'm still getting used to that one. So we do encourage you guys to find these um, articles and read. Again, I think it will help everybody as we move forward in improving our communications and helping move that needle on long-term behavior change. And now what most of you are waiting for, as we mentioned, this is good for 1.5 hours of continuing professional education credits. The certificate of completion can be found on our website, again, our Food and Health resource page, www.foodinsight.org backslash food and health 2012.aspx that will be posted again about one hour after this webcast and you will receive an email that includes that link again approximately one hour after the webcast and with that we would like to thank all of you for your participation on today's webcast i hope you found it informative and that you can really move for go forward and um, let's change the conversation as it relates to nutrition and health thank you all <laughs>